<clears throat> well, most of you, if not probably all of you, know the expression, I'm from Missouri, show me, right? I think it's on the license plates, the Missouri license plates. Although it's not the official slogan of the state, <laughs> it's something that's very established. So I got curious about that, I thought, where did that come from? How did that get started? And it's, it's not at all clear to <laughs> say, there's, there's some people that say it's this and everybody else says, no, no, that really wasn't it, it started before that. And anyway, it seems to have started somewhere in the 1890s. And one of the stories I read, this is the earliest story, was a story, was a, was a, uh, it was a, reported in a newspaper clipping from about that time, about 1897 or something like that, where this fella had apparently, uh, from, from Missouri, he'd, he'd been on a train and he jumped off the train uh, because he, he was very concerned about the direction it was taking. And so the, the, the doctor's stitching him up and asked him, what happened? How come you're in such a mess? He said, well, he says, I was on the train and we were riding along and I could see it was just dis there was a mountain ahead and it was just d disappearing into this big black hole in the mountain, he said. So I'm not stupid. <laughs> he said, I jumped off the train and that's why I'm all wrecked up here today. And that's, I, I paraphrase. <laughs> so then the people said, Ye, well, yeah, except that's a tunnel through the mountain that goes to the other side. And he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> so they took him out and, you know, made it apparent to him that, uh, you know, that that was the case. And so he says, well, I'm from Missouri. I guess you have to show me. So, so that's, that's the first story I've heard. Now, you see, that didn't look real good. That kind of a story didn't look real good on the Missourians. So, so, so they wanted to change the theme so it's more like, you know, it's not that they were bumbling, uh, you know, uh, country bumpkins that don't understand the ways of the world, <laughs> which is kind of how that looked. They wanted to present themselves as, you know, she, I'm from Missouri, you have to show me, we're not naive, you know, we're, 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 we're wise to the ways of the world and we, you, can't, you, can't, uh, you can't bamboozle us easily. And so, so a little later on, a few years later, and I'm not sure how this all joined together, but one of the uh, House of Rep guys at the, in the U.S. House of Representatives from Missouri, uh, he has this famous quote. Uh, his name was Willard Duncan Van Diver, and this is what has popularized the quote. He says, I come from a state that raises corn and cotton, cockleburs and Democrats, and frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I'm from Missouri, and you have got to show me. <laughs> so that put, put a little different spin on, on the story. So the disciple Thomas in this story here today, which Lisa read, um, is kind of a Missourian, wouldn't you say? And he, he's definitely a guy that you had to show. <laughs> and uh, that, that's, that's how the story unfolds. So it, the, the, as the story begins, we're still on the, on the night of Easter. So this is basically like Easter evening, uh, the, first, the very first day. And the disciples, it doesn't tell us how many or who exactly they were. We, we've always assumed that there's uh, the 12 or the 11, what, minus, like 12 minus Judas. But apparently, if you, if you go to the Gospel of Luke, there's another guy. One of the guys that's on the road to Emmaus is also there. His name was Cleopas, and he's not one of the 12. <laughs> so who knows how many were there? They were in this room. And Jesus shows up. And they're a little freaked out, and he says, peace be with you, he calms them down, and they see him, they're delighted, they're overjoyed, uh, it's incredible. And then they see Thomas and they tell him, we saw the Lord. He says, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> he's a little incredulous. In fact, he's a lot incredulous, and he says, you know, unless I put my fingers in the nail prints of his hands and put my hand in his side, I'm not gonna believe it. So then a week later, which is basically today, so, you know, in, in the time spans of things, so eight, eight, it says eight days later, but that's probably a week in the, in the Hebrew thinking. Um, uh, they're back in the same room. Thomas is there, and Jesus shows up again. And he says, Thomas, come here. He says, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. You know, just do what you said you needed to do so that you, you, you know for sure for your own self. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. So Thomas comes to uh, instantaneous, complete uh, belief in the risen Lord. <laughs> and he, he utters this, which is kind of the punchline to the Gospel of John. I mean, if you read the Gospel of John, you and I are to come to that conclusion. And that's the, that's the conviction that we're being led to. And so this is, you know, this is this great line, my Lord and my God. Um, so... And he says to him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Interesting. So 
this is one of the stories, or some of the stories of the appearances. I mean, Jesus put in, uh, put in some appearances, <laughs> as we like to say. He, he put in an appearance. He put in a bunch of appearances after uh, his resurrection. <laughs> so even the first day was, was pretty chock full of appearances. So the first, we, we read the one last week on Easter Day, but uh, he appeared to Mary Magdalene uh, just in the garden outside the tomb. Uh, it appears that soon after that, he appeared to, to Peter um, in the middle of the day sometime when the, those other guys were walking to uh, Emmaus, which is the, the story for next week. There's two, two of the disciples, walk, one of them is Cleopas, were walking to Emmaus, which is a town about, I forget, 10 miles out of town or something, to the north of Jerusalem. Um, he, he, he appears to them, and they, they don't recognize him in that whole story. And then they run back to Jerusalem to tell the rest of the guys, and they say, yeah, we know, he's appeared to Peter. And they're all in the room, and then he appears to them again. So that's four times just on the first day. <laughs> then as, so then the next week, which is the equivalent of today, that he appears once again to them in this room. There are several, there's other appearances are, are related to us in the Gospel of John. Uh, by the time we get to uh, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, Peter is talking about this quite, uh, quite freely. So the, the other reading we had in the other churches was from Acts 2, which is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. So just part of that, that sermon, after he talks about Jesus being crucified, uh, and uh, he, he says it's predicted in, even in the Old Testament uh, in the, by the prophets. <clears throat> and his, one of his punchlines is, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. <laughs> now, Peter was talking on behalf of about 120 disciples who had, been, who had uh, stayed around in Jerusalem to wait for Christ had promised that the Holy Spirit would show up in some way. He shows up on this day. And Peter has the courage and the, uh, the gift to speak boldly to the people that were there. And yet, that's what he says. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. So there were a lot of other appearances, too. So in, in, you look at Paul in his uh, letter, to the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, which is a whole chapter about the resurrection. He starts it off by, by naming a lot of these appearances. He appeared first to this one and this and that one. He says, then he appeared to <clears throat> more than 500 people at once most of whom are still alive. So at the telling of this, you know, at the writing of his letter to, to the church in Corinth, Paul tells him, he says, that Jesus actually appeared to 500 people at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. So, which was their kind of a euphemism for, for they had died. But he said, so what he was essentially saying is, if you really want to, you can go back to uh, uh, Jerusalem area and you can check around and you'll find people that actually were there. And saw him, and the evidence is, is amazing. There's so many, so many appearances. Well, verse 29 of John 20 says, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So most of us didn't get that experience. We didn't see. And yet most of us believe, if not all, I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. So there's a blessing pronounced by Jesus on us. But is Jesus really saying, and is John who related this, John the, the writer of the gospel saying, basically you should just listen to these guys, hear their, their testimony about Jesus being risen, and you should get to believe in there. And the answer is, yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's something about scripture, there's power in scripture. And just it by itself has over these centuries brought many people to faith. People just hearing these words read to them or reading them for themselves, have come to faith in Christ. Now, there's a story in Alpha. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't got it entirely accurate. I've heard it a few times, but the memory slips at certain ages, just say. So the, 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 one of the stories is of this guy who was a, a kind of a, a wild guy. He was very rich and uh, liked, liked to get into the drugs and stuff. And he ended up in the hospital for some reason. He was recovering, and somebody brought him a, a New Testament. And it's so his, his story was, he, start, he, didn't, he, didn't, he had weed, but he didn't have paper to, to roll his weed in. So he would read a page in the New Testament, uh, and then he would tear it out and roll up uh, to make a stogie out of, you know? And he, he, he would smoke that one. And then he'd, the next, he'd, read, he'd read the next page, and he'd roll it up, and he'd, he'd toke that one. And he says, I got, I got about to the Gospel of John, and I became a Christian. <laughs> Amazing. So it, it, Billy Graham used to just say, you know, the Bible says... And people would, you know, just respected that. Because there is power, because it is, 
It is penned by, it's inspired by the God's Holy Spirit, although it was human beings, fallible human beings wrote it. So the Holy Spirit had it you know, kind of led the writing of it, and then he also witnesses to it when people read it. So that's how, how people come to faith. So yeah, that, that's, that's the normal way, but you may be more like Thomas. <laughs> you may be more of a Missourian, and that's okay. I mean, basically, to me, what the scripture teaches us is it's okay. You know, he was like, I don't, I'm not going to buy that. That's ridiculous. <laughs> There's no way that could have happened. And, uh, and yet, he, he, because he was an honest skeptic, he was given the evidence that he needed. So uh, uh, I like to, to, uh, to present those evidences every once in a while. And there, there's a lot of things around here that, that, are not, that are just kind of objective, the facts of the way things unfolded in this world that uh, should give us at least pause for thought, if not, if not the conviction that, uh, that what we believe is actually true. And uh, some of them are th uh, things like just the claim of the resurrection. That's so audacious. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You know, uh, our whole faith as Christians, as followers of Christ, is based on, in part, in the, well, actually entirely. Paul says, unless Jesus was raised from, if, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, we are of all people most to be pitied. You know, we're also, we, we've also mis, misrepresented God because we're telling people that he raised this guy from the dead and he didn't do it if Jesus wasn't raised. And also, he says, you're still in your sins and your faith is futile if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. But, but <laughs> a guy was raised from the dead? Come on. <laughs> I mean, that was the early proclamation. If you go through the book of Acts, that is the thing, that they, the linchpin upon which they, their, 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 their preaching was always based. They would say, you know, like Peter said in, in Book of Acts, and of this we are witnesses, of this fact. They would say, and then later on, even I, we let, read it a bit last week, um, when he's talking for the first time to gen, the Gentiles, he says, you know, we are witnesses of his resurrection. He came back to life. So, so the, the starting point is just this: that they claimed that their leader has risen from the dead. He's come back to life after being stone cold dead. Nobody does that. So, if, if you look at the history of human religions and human belief systems, they're almost entirely based on some wise person who's got some kind of insight into the human, human needs. And you know, if you live this way, if you follow this pattern of life, uh, you know, follow this wisdom, you know, that, that will help you be better people and maybe go on to the next world in a better shape or something like that. None of them come up with the idea that the guy that this, this wise teacher died and rose again, <laughs> came back to life. So just that to me is, 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 tells me that it's not a human concoction. People don't come up with that kind of idea. And the second one, which is tied to that one, is the crucifixion, which is not, not attested, or not, not uh, uh, what's the word, not attested, uh, discounted by anybody. You know, historians, atheists, everybody, no, nobody really d would deny that this guy was crucified. The evidence is strong that he was. And yet this is our, this is our, our other main central tenet of our faith, that, that we believe in a, a person who was crucified. So he was executed in one of the most in the cruelest, shameful ways devised by humankind. Now again, in, in Jesus, and, and yet this faith took off like wildfire. In Jesus' day, um, uh, he lived in a culture, and it's still the culture today of the Middle East, is a, is, a, is a shame honor culture. So they're way more, we have that a bit. We don't like to be shamed. We like to get honors. <laughs> but they're like, it's, it's like immense. To be shamed is hor horrific. And to get honors is, is, is wonderful. But uh, the most shameful thing that can happen to you is to be hung up in public n naked. And it was so shameful that people would basically renounce the name of that person. If their family member that they loved and the child that they bore was crucified, they basically erased their name from the family history and memories. And he was never spoken of again. And this is incredibly shameful. And, th and, that's <laughs> and these guys are going around touting that our leader was someone who was crucified doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. It's not hu humanly, it's not logical. So to me, that's another uh, argument that it must have really happened and it must be really crucial. In fact, the word crucial comes from the word cross. But that's another story. And third, uh, the, uh, along the same line, is the early claim uh, from very early days that this guy was also God. <laughs> so, so, you know, if you, that actually God come in the flesh. Even, so last, you know, two weeks ago we read the, the, the passage from Philippians where uh, Paul says, 
Um, he, he quotes what looks to be, most scholars think was a hymn from the early church. So it was very early days, and, and Paul wrote Philippians probably in the 40s or 50s, somewhere maybe in the 50s of the first century. So this is when you know, the, the, the faith was very fresh and new. And he says, have this mind in you which, was, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So he's already clearly stating the belief that this guy was also God. And Jesus himself basically says the same thing throughout the Gospels and demonstrates that by his you know, raising the dead and walking on the water and all these things that only God was supposed to be able to do. Uh, so, so that early claim is also ridiculous. So if, you, if you're starting your own religion and your own faith system as a human being, you don't do those things. N none of those guys, Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, none of them ever said, well, I'm actually the living God walking among you. It's so audacious. <laughs> uh, you gotta do something with that. So th those are way out of the park uh, claims that the, the, the faith was built on. The resurrection, the crucifixion, and the claim that Jesus was God. A, f a fourth thing is, to me, this miracle, this thing we call the Bible, this is an astounding phenomenon, this book. It's actually 66 books, it's a collection of books. It's so incredible. I mean, it's, there's so much integrity in it, so much consistency in it, over you know, almost uh, like 1,600 years of authorship, Consistency in the thinking and the belief system that you find there, the depth, the wisdom, and the, its power to withstand criticism. I mean, there's no, no book in the world has been so picked at, so, so, uh, so closely uh, examined and pulled through and questioned than the Bible. And it stands, it stands the test of time. It's amazing. And, and, and much of it is based in history. And so, so you can actually go and do the historical examination to see if it's credible at all. And again and again, it's, it, it, you know, it, I mean, there, there, there are questions and there's things that haven't been answered, but there's so many things that have been answered and so are crystal clear that it's historically reliable, for instance. Uh, you know, the, the things that, it, the way it describes the world in Jesus' day or the world it, that it, it describes in David's day or Moses' day or, the, or Egypt, you know, all those things, they ring true. Uh, so it, it, it kind of stands up to that, that uh, intense scrutiny and criticism. It's compelling. It's creative, it's just full of uniqueness as you go along, nothing, rep not particularly repetitive at all, and it's, it's commanding. I mean, it, 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 you know, it, it grabs you and says, this is what it's about, and you can sense the authority coming through. So that's a fourth, and the fifth is this, and it's important, uh, and that is the teachings of Jesus. Um, I know lots of people that are non-Christians, they may be from other faiths or they may be atheists, whatever, they're impressed by Jesus, and rightly so, because Jesus stood head and shoulders plus above the crowd in the things he taught, in the way he taught things. Um, we, we don't all, because we're so, we're so, as Christians, we're kind of so uh, soaked in the teachings of Jesus, we don't realize how out of, the, out, out of this world it was when he started saying the things he did. But he basically said, everything's about love, guys. It's all about love. <laughs> love, love, love. And this is in a world where it was not, that's not the worldview of most people, in, in, especially in Jesus' day. He says, here's the thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. Just, you know, you do those, you've, you, all those laws and things, they're all fulfilled in that, in, in loving. And, you know, but, oh, and also while you're at it, love your enemies, guys. You know, if somebody slaps you on the one cheek, turn the other cheek. Pray for those who persecute you. I mean, do you realize how radical this teaching was? And yet how healthy it was and is. So it's only actually fairly recently that psychologists and psychiatrists of our day, the modern day, have said, you know, actually he was right. <laughs> you know, instead of us, and what's been the human pattern is if somebody hits you or hurts you in some way is to be, take vengeance upon them and to hate them and to hold bitterness and grudges in your heart against them. And that's a big struggle of the human race. And Jesus says, yeah, that's, that's not good for you. <laughs> you need to learn to, to, to forgive, and boy, forgive, forgive, forgive. He just hammers this stuff home all the way through the Gospels. Forgive, forgive, love, love, love. Um, grace, grace, grace. Mercy, mercy, mercy. And that's why he's so wonderful. That's just, that's just kind of some of his basic teachings about how to live your life. And on top of that, he, li he lived in a world where there was so, much, uh, so many barriers 
and so many ways of putting people down. You know, you should never go near these people. They're unclean. So Jesus goes and talks with them and touches them and, and does all that. And, and oh, women, they're way down here. So Jesus brings them way back up here. I mean, he was so far beyond any, any, anybody in his day, to, even to this day. So, so these things, you may not even be convinced to be a follower of Jesus from hearing these things. These are objective things, things you can examine or, or a seeker could look at and, and, and see, yeah, that's, that certainly gives me pause <laughs> for thought. And so you can show those things. You can, you can uh, demonstrate those things. But that will not make a believer, that will not make a Christian. This objective stuff, together with the subjective, the experience of God, is what makes us followers of Jesus. We're not working on, it, it's not like we're Democrats and Republicans. We happen to have this belief, and we ha- or we happen to have this belief. I mean, we, we happen to have beliefs, but we're only followers of Jesus and Christians if we've actually experienced and encountered the living God. And that works by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is actually the agent of personal experience in a, in a, in a human life. So if, if this stuff begins to make sense to us, if Jesus, the, his death and his resurrection has meaning to our hearts, that's because the Holy Spirit has brought that into, your, into, you know, into your, the human breast so that it clicks with your heart and your soul and your mind and your spirit and your conscience and you say, yeah, of course. <laughs> it all makes sense. But that's, that, and that's experiential. And the two have to go together. Uh, the objective kind of evidence for... Uh, for the, the truth and the reality of Christ and what he says and teaches and, and, uh, uh, and what faith in him means and then the experience of it. And so as this finishes the, the text in John, he says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. In verse 31, but these are written, there's many things that other signs, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You may have life in his name. So if once we become believers, once the Holy Spirit brings all this home to us, we have life in his name. Now we're not talking about just life like, you know, oh, I get up in the morning and I have something to eat and I, you know, I can walk around and stuff, <laughs> like biological life. Uh, see, even the Greeks had different words for life. One of their words, bios, is one of the Greek words for life from which we get biology. You know, we, plants are alive and cats are alive and we're alive. But that's not the word that's used here. This word is zoe, that John uses all through his gospel. And sometimes you, you notice all everybody's calling their kids in the last few decades zoe. <laughs> so zoe is this Greek word that means life. And it, it often gets joined together with eternal, so eternal life through the, through the gospel of John. So it's, it's, it's way beyond just biological life. It's, it's a quality of life. It's an essence of life that is, as Jesus says, life that is life indeed. It's abundant life. He says that you may have life and have it abundantly. It's joyful, it's hopeful, it's peaceful, it's loving, it's adventuresome, because it's walking with the living God. That kind of life. And that life is actually Christ within us. That's where the risen Christ is today. He's within his people, within his followers, within his disciples. And what he's out to do through us and in us is to change this world. Shall we pray?